All right. Hey guys. So thank you so much for coming to our how to buy a short term rental in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee call for those of you who don't know who I am or who we are and what we do. My name is Avery Carl. I am a real estate investor with 105 doors, eight of which are short term rentals was able to get from zero to 105 over the course of about five years because I strategically invested in short terms towards the beginning of our portfolio. And since they cash flow so much heavier than long terms, we were able to scale much more quickly than if we had started with traditional long terms. Uh, I also run the short term shop, which is a real estate agency brokered by eXp. I have to say that or else I get in trouble. And uh, what we do, we work exclusively with short-term rental investors. So we don't take any type of client other than short-term rental buyers or sellers. We connected our buyer clients with just over a thousand cash flowing properties last year across 10 different markets. And uh, if you have interest in those, head over to our website, theshorttermshop.com. Today, we are talking about the Smoky Mountains. Uh, also, if you have not picked up my book, Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth, please do that. It was an Amazon bestseller in four categories. Uh, if you just aren't quite sure how to do this yet, that's a great place to start. So I will go ahead and start the presentation on how to buy a short-term rental in the Smokies. Well, actually, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, my guest, my co-host today. I've got... Luke, the Director of Education at the Short Term Shop. I have Julie and Tim, two of our top agents in the Smokies, also very, very experienced investors, and uh, they're all going to be joining in the presentation. We'll do the presentation will be just a few minutes, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A at the end. And uh, let's get started, I guess. So, all right, why do people come to the Smoky Mountains? What is the tourism draw? So there's a lot of things to do here, not just the National Park. We'll kind of get into the nuts and bolts of the National Park travel in just a minute. There are a lot of other attractions in the Smokies besides just the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, which by the way, is the number one most visited national park in the country by over double. I think the Grand Canyon had less than half of the tourism that the Smokies had last year. And it's been that way for quite a few years now. So lots of things to do. Dollywood is a big one. Y'all, Dollywood is not a town in the Smokies. Dollywood is a, is a theme park. It's not a town. Uh, also lots of different kid attractions, uh, tons of go-kart places. Like if you drive up and down the parkway in Pigeon Forge or in Gatlinburg, lots of stuff to do. Aquarium, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, Soaky Mountain, big, huge water park. I haven't been to a water park since I was a kid, but uh, lots and lots and lots of things to do here for all types of people, not just hikers and outdoorsy types. All right, regulations for buying short-term rentals here, very, very established as of decades ago. So the Smokies started being developed like in the 50s and 60s for vacation rentals, which means vacation rentals have been around since before the internet. So the um, regulations are very, very established. The cities and counties figured out how to, county really, figured out how to monetize them decades ago. So it would be way too detrimental to the local economy for them to ever regulate against short-term rentals. Uh, permitting process, licensing process is pretty easy. I'm going to let Luke go over that real quick. Yeah, Avery, uh, you already nailed it there pretty much. Uh, not much more to it. Uh, this is a very short-term rental friendly area. There are more short-terms than primaries by far, and um, they want us to be there. We do need to be good hosts, of course. We need to maintain a good property and uh, not make our neighbors upset, things like that. But as far as uh, the local government is concerned, they, they want us to be there and they want us to be paying our taxes and they make it pretty easy on us. You're going to need a business license, um, in most cases, if you're only operating on Airbnb and Verbo, such uh, the same as uh, in most short-term shop uh, markets, it's going to be uh, an Airbnb and Verbo uh, paying, collecting and paying your sales and occupancy taxes for you. In almost all of the areas, there are some exceptions to that, such as within the city limits of Gatlinburg and within the city limits of Pigeon Forge, which are actually very small areas. And uh, the other folks on the call will touch uh, more in detail on the on that as we uh, continue here but again uh as far as regulations are concerned this is uh, definitely one of the most friendly areas uh, likely uh, on the planet thanks luke so i said i would get further into the nuts and bolts of the tourism to the smoky mountain national park 
earlier. So here it is. This is an actual graph with data pulled from the National Parks website. You guys can go pull that up yourself. Uh, so it's consistently the most visited national park in the country, as I said, and it is situated within a day's drive of between one third and one half of the population of the United States. So not mileage wise, but population wise. And as you can see, uh, it has the tourism has not dipped below 8 million in years and years. And it's actually been on an upward trend since I can't see the graph like uh, for the past 15 years looks like so. Um, Definitely an area that is growing. Uh, there are not at this moment enough cabins, we call them cabins, short-term rentals to accommodate the amount of tourism coming in. And there are very, very few hotels. There are some hotels, there are some resorts, but typically the average tourist who's coming to visit the Smokies is looking to stay in a single family cabin or cabin style or chalet property. So that's kind of what you're looking for. Uh, a lot of people talk about the Smoky Mountains. I think pretty much everyone who knows anyone who is a short-term rental investor, pro that person probably has a property in the Smokies. It is a very, very good area to invest in the Smokies. It's uh, to invest in short-term rentals, it is certainly getting a lot of investor attention now. I would not necessarily say that, again, that it is saturated. We get that question a lot because there are still not enough properties to take care of the amount of tourists, especially the amount of growth coming in. So the Smoky Mountain area, the cities and towns, Tim and Julie are going to touch on that in a minute. But at the end of the day, you know, we're getting over a million new visitors year over year. And the park last year got 13 or 14 million, but that doesn't include the rest of the area. I think I saw a stat recently that 20 million people actually came to the Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg area, 13 or 14 of million of those actually went into the park last year. So um, definitely an area that even if these weren't really small rural towns, even if they were big metro markets, would have a lot of trouble with development keeping up with that amount of growth. So I will turn it over to Tim or Julie from this point forward. So y'all say, hey. Hey, thanks guys for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm Julie McCoy. Hey I'm guys. <laughs> I'm one of the agents with uh, the short-term shop and I currently own uh, five operating overnight rentals here in the area. And by the end of 2022, I should be up to, I think eight is the current plan. So, uh, and that's a, a little bit about me, Tim. Oh, Tim, I think your video froze. Oh, it's me. No, it's it's Tim. He froze. So we'll come back to him in a minute if you want to take over. Yeah, no problem. So um, this is this map that you see in front of you is just kind of a very general idea of the territory that is ideal for overnight rentals here in the area. Um, like Avery mentioned, there is a ton of attractions that are kind of scattered around the area, not limited to the national park at all. And so just in the interest of giving you um, something of a boundary, then you know, we created this map. It's not a hard and fast line, um, but this is the general territory where we recommend buying for the most optimal performance. Tim, looks like you're back. I'm back. Yourself. So, uh, yeah, I lost the uh, internet there for a second. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, just kind of jumping in this slide, this kind of Julie just kind of talked about our general area and it just popped up over here. Uh, this is kind of what Avery was talking about as far as one third to one half of the population. Uh, so this is roughly a 600 mile radius around the Smoky Mountain Park and, uh, the top right image there. Uh, so as you can see, that's a easy day's drive, uh, maybe a long day's drive, but it's definitely drivable. And, uh, there are a lot of people inside that circle and that, that doesn't, that's not all the people that come here. You know, we get people from all over the rest of the country and the world, but that driving distance is what really drives a huge bulk of the people that come here. Yeah. And I think has really helped this area thrive in a COVID and post COVID, um, era, where people are trying to avoid air travel a lot and uh, staying more local. And it makes us a very affordable destination where you can bring your family, just pile in the car instead of buying, you know, four or five, six plane tickets. Um, so that's been, I think, definitely a key to our ongoing success as a market here. Yep. So in the area here, um, we have basically three big towns or not three big towns. They're not big at all. Three, three main towns. towns. We have uh, Sevierville, 
uh, Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. And those are kind of getting highlighted on there. And uh, as we all talk about, these are actually very, 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 nobody lives here. This is a tourist area. So as you can see, the population of Gatlinburg's 3,000 people, 3,700 people, uh, Pigeon Forge is 6,000 and Sevierville is like 17, 18,000. So, you know, really nobody lives here, but we get, you know, 20 million people a year that come here. So that's why our area here that we can buy is so big, uh, you know, it's kind of a general rule of thumb, you know, 20 to 30 minutes from either Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg does really, really, really well here. Uh, the area kind of continues, continues to expand outwards in all directions. Uh, up north is getting more popular, all the way out to Cosby is getting more popular. That used to be kind of a, we used to kind of stop this before Cosby and before Townsend, but with all their growth, those areas are getting a lot more popular. They're both really cool areas. Um, a little bit about, you know, addresses when you're looking here, a lot of people, they want, they think they want something in, or in Gatlinburg or in Pigeon Forge. That's the main two that people want. Uh, the majority of the addresses here are actually called Sevierville, and they're actually in the Sevier County. So uh, as you search for properties in this area, don't be alarmed at all. Anything that's not in either Gatlinburg proper or Pigeon Forge proper is going to have a Sevierville address. So all the rest of the, anything that's not basically circled by those red lines is going to have a Sevierville address. So anything else on that, Julie? No, that, that pretty much covers it. Um wanted yeah that was a point of confusion for me when i was first buying here i was like well it says severville and so i'm thinking that it's by the town of severville and uh, it's not necessarily true at all so having i think a visual of like this map and just this general area is really helpful so when you see a property where you're like hey that looks like a great option see where it is on a map um if it has a severeville address because it may not be close to the town of Sevierville at all. It may actually be just outside of Gatlinburg. Um, but because it's in the unincorporated county, it still has a Sevierville address. So that's just a little tip um, to help you in your search. Um, Townsend wasn't really visible um, on the previous slide, but it's kind of down in the lower left. Um, you go through a little pass between Where's Valley, <coughs> excuse me, Where's Valley and Townsend. Townsend is the uh, the entrance to Cades Cove, which is one of the most popular destinations in the uh, Smoky Mountain National Park. It also has a great river, the Little Pigeon River, <laughs> for tubing in the summer. Um, and is just a beautiful little town and a little quieter off, you know, off the beaten path, but is growing in popularity. And then on the north side, it's not really in our map here, but Tim touched on this, um, even north, of the town of Sevierville, um, further up towards um, I-40, beyond you know, off the grid of this map, um, we're seeing a lot of development out that way as well. Um, the Cherokee Nation is doing a major development up um, in the area by a town called Kodak, which is right where you know I-40 um, and exit 402, which comes down this way is we're seeing a lot of development out that way. So I anticipate that as the years go on, we're going to see a bigger push in that area north of this map as well. So the area is always expanding. Um, in this map right here, you can just see a few of the uh, attractions on here. You can see Dollywood down by Pigeon Forge, but there's also Sucky Mountain Water Park, which is up on the north side. And, um, you know, on the far east side, you see a place called Climeworks, which is a great outdoor activity area, um, and over Gatlinburg, down on the very south side is our little ski area slash, you know, kind of small theme park that's been established since the 60s and continues to, uh, to draw tourism year over year. Yeah. And the cool thing about this is, is, you know, there's not one spot. You don't have to be in Gatlinburg or in Pigeon Forge. It is truly this entire area. Uh, going back to that slide, you know, way at the beginning when Avery was talking about all the different things to do, uh, people come here to do all those different things and they're scattered around and there's people that never even go into a town. Sometimes people just sit out in the woods in the cabin. Some people hike the whole time. Some people want to ride go-karts all day long. But the, the sheer number of guests we get is so much larger than most areas. It, there is truly room for everybody. And uh, really any of these you know, properties in this entire area just do well. Uh, so that is a huge question we get asked is, you know, where do we want to be and which one's better and all that. It, it's truly, you know, you may attract a little different guests in one area or another, but it's not going to be a lack of guests really in any of it. So. Yeah. I think we can. Yeah. So. 
current state of the market, we are, you know, the Smokies is rising in popularity, not just as a tourist de destination, but also definitely as a investment des destination. Um, so we're seeing a growing interest that, uh, that is definitely having, having an impact on the market. We literally can't build the properties fast enough. Um, so it is a very competitive market. But even with the, the appreciation that has been seen over the last couple of years, it can still yield some really great returns. Um, you just got to be prepared for, prepared for a fight. It's going to take some effort and, um, and a bit of a leap of faith to get property under contract. But we are, um, you know, all of us agents here at the, <laughs> at the short term shop are very experienced and can help guide you and understand what it'll take to win, to win a property here. Tim, do you have anything to add to the stay in the market? Yeah, so you know, really, you know, like like Julie said, this is a hot market, and uh, and really, really, with any kind of investing, you want to do your homework. But something I had to learn the hard way when I first started investing here is you need to be prepared to offer on what this property is worth to you, not necessarily just the asking price. Uh, the Smokies gets a lot of chatter about you know the amount of offers and where things are and all that. Uh, the truth to that is there is a lot of fluctuation in the asking prices just as much as there is anything else. And ultimately the properties usually end up selling for what they're worth to an investor. So, uh, learning to, you know, learning to choose what the property is worth based on your returns and what it's going to do in revenue is key to winning here. Uh, once I started doing that, that's when I started winning and, uh, uh my agent had to pound that into me a little bit back in the day. And, uh, my agent happened to be Julie. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, as you learn that, it, it, that, that's, that's incredibly important in your journey here. Uh, so I've heard Avery say it before and it's hard pill to swallow, but you almost have to ignore the rental history and you have to ignore the asking price and you need to figure out what do you think you can do with this property? And what does that, and with that amount of money, what's it worth to you? What's the purchase price worth? And uh, with that, the enemy method, you know, is probably the number one way to figure out what this property can do. Uh, and the enemy methods heavily covered in videos by both Luke and Avery. If you go out on our YouTube channel, there's videos out there. And, uh, and also just, if you get on our Facebook pages, a lot of our, our clients, you know, like to talk about, you know, what they do with these properties. And that's awesome. That's the, we're all here to help each other. You know, there's, there's plenty of these things to go around and plenty, you know, we can all help each other. But uh, uh, get out there and, you know, get on Facebook and search around and get on, you know, I'll do all the enemy methods and, and, and people like to talk about it. So anyway, that's my yep. spiel on that. <laughs> and uh, since we, you, since we do have a, you know, a shortage of inventory, we've got more demand than there is supply. And, um, and that's resulted in a bit of a building boom around here. But still, we can't keep up with the demand. I just want to speak briefly on some of the different types of builds that you will encounter out here as you're looking for, um, for a property of your own and understand some of the pros and cons. So the, starting on the left, we've got what's called a spec build. So this is a property where a investor or a developer or a builder has purchased a lot. They've developed a plan. They are financing the build, they are building the house, and when the house is complete, it is going to be sold. Um, they, are, they are speculating on the property being worth more than they are going to put into it, hence spec build. Um, you will see these marketed anywhere from, you know, like the one in the photo on the left, that one's a couple of months away from completion. They listed it, they want to get a contract on it before it's actually complete. But sometimes they haven't even broken ground yet and they're marketing the lot and the plan. Um, the builder's still, you know, the seller is still going to provide the financing for the build, but you wouldn't close on, <coughs> you wouldn't close on the property <laughs> until it is complete. And that build time can take anywhere from you know eight to 12 months, possibly longer, depending on the size and complexity of the architecture. Um, in the middle, we've got pre-construction. So this is a term that gets used around here a lot. And it means that there is a package that is being marketed. It is the lot, it is the plan, and is the builder. So all of these elements are ready to go. But the seller in this case is not providing financing. The buyer will be the one who is responsible for obtaining a construction loan and financing the build. So 
They are marketing a product that you can buy, but you will need to bring the construction loan. Um, there are a limited number of lenders who offer construction loans, and I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, but it's not just you know your everyday loan officer who you know loaned on your primary. They're probably not going to carry them. So we can definitely help if that's something you're interested in. We have relationships with banks who do offer these loans. Um, but that is an option. This is going to be the most plentiful option you see. Um, it's a little more involved in terms of just obtaining the right, you know, the right kind of financing, a few more hoops to jump through. There are some limited carrying costs involved because you'd be paying generally it's interest only on the loan while it's while the house is being built, but there are some, you know, some small costs involved. And then once the house is complete, you would usually refinance into a conventional loan or you know some other fixed term loan once it's um, once it's complete. And we can help guide you through some of the you know providers who are you know more more reputable and you can have a smoother process than some of the others. We can we can help you you know, figure that out as well. And then the final. Hey Julie, uh, hey Julie, real yeah. quick, you want to hit you want to hit time frame on a pre construction real quick, just kind of a general sure. range of what what they can. Yeah, so generally the closing, I mean, the first step really is obtaining the financing on it, and that usually takes forty five to sixty days to kind of go through the process and underwriting. They will do an appraisal based on the anticipated value of the property once it's complete. Um, so up front, you're looking at 45 to 60 days. And then once you're closed on the loan over this period of time, you'll also purchase the lot, generally speaking. Um, once you're closed on that process, that's when they'll break ground. And then you still get into probably the eight to 12 plus months time frame for the build, again, depending on the size and, um, you know, size and complexity of the project. I also want to say new construction never, ever, 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 ever finishes on time. Delays are unfortunately a reality. And um, there are many things outside of any one builder's control, including the weather, supply chain, um, the labor force, and so forth. So if this is a path you, you want to go down, just be prepared to be patient. Be Could prepared be a year. for <laughs> what is that? It could be a year. I just wanted to hit on that. Oh, it could be, it, it could it be could more, be than, more a than a year. It could be more than it could a be year. well more than it could be well over a year, um, depending. And I'm going to get into that in just a second, because the last thing we have, <coughs> excuse me, is a custom build. And so this would be a situation where you are purchasing the lot and then you are going to find your builder. You're going to find your architect or your floor plan, you know, we, we don't necessarily need full-scale architects for the plans that get drawn here, but you will develop a plan, um, you know, and have an engineer check it off to build the whatever cabin you envision, whether that's your dream cabin or whether that's just something that, you know, you want to check all the boxes for a great rental. You're the one in the driver's seat on a custom build. Um, these are definitely the most complex. These take the longest. These are often the most expensive. Um, and there's a lot of things that go into it that may not um, be readily apparent from the beginning. Just finding a lot around here can be really complicated because depending on the size of the property you wanna build, you've got to consider the, you know, the slope, the ground quality, the access, um, most properties out here are on septic systems and there are, you know, the county requires a certain area and quality of land in order to, you know, accommodate a septic system of a certain size. So if you're like, hey, I want a six bedroom house with a view, um, it's really, really, really hard to find a view lot that can accommodate six bedrooms, um, even if it's even if it's three acres, I mean, most of that acreage may not be usable for a septic system. So finding a lot, it's something like that's the longest process of all of these steps. 
I actually have two custom builds that are underway right now. We have surpassed the two year mark from when I purchased the land to completion and um, they're nearly complete, but they're not there yet. And it's been over two years. So if that's something you want to pursue. And Julie is uh, heavily, heavily experienced. <laughs> it's a, so. Yeah, but it's, it is a major process. Um, so be, uh, be prepared for that. And you're at the mercy of, uh, you know, supply chain and materials costs and, and things like that as well. So unless you really want to, uh, and of course you're, you're financing the whole thing as well. So, uh, so yeah, it's not for the, not for the faint of heart. I'm not certain I would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've got a few things to throw in here. So, uh, couple pros and cons to building or just buying something that, uh, that hits the market. Uh, if you are, whether you're doing, well, spec builds are typically, they sell them once they're finished. So you would be getting that, um, pretty quickly, but with pre-construction, or if you're going to go down the custom build route, uh, you're not going to have any cash flow for, uh, at least a year, sometimes several. So keep that in mind. Uh, there's no wrong way to do this if you want to do it that way or by, I'm more of an existing construction kind of gal myself, but Julie, obviously from all of her knowledge, uh, likes to build them. Can you tell she's a developer? Um, <laughs> so there's no wrong way to do it, but if you're ready to like start making moves and really bootstrap and start scaling your portfolio pretty quickly, you probably want to go existing construction, but people ask about these all the time. So hence the slide on it. All right. So one thing that I wanted to touch on about purchase prices. So um, a lot of people get really hung up on, yes, things are a lot more expensive now than they used to be. And the best time to buy real estate is, was always yesterday or 10 years ago, but the second best time is today. So the most important thing, like, yes, the person you're buying it from will have paid less than you, probably a significant amount less than you, but Back to the numbers running, make sure the numbers work at the price you're able to get it for. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what someone else paid for things. You have to make sure that that gross income you're going to get makes sense at the purchase price you are able to get it. Uh, I've seen people in Facebook groups and things who are having trouble winning deals say things like, there's no more deals left in the Smokies. Well, that's not true. The deals aren't what they were five years ago. I think Julie actually, for example, had a property that she bought in maybe 2019 that she had a 100% cash on cash return on. Now that is absolutely ridiculous. And no, those deals are not out there anymore, but you can still get well into the 30% cash on cash return range, sometimes higher, uh, depending on your own personal circumstances. So no, you can't get 100% anymore, but you can still get a really great cash on cash return better than any other asset class, assuming that you buy the right property. So just keep that in mind, make sure that you're running your numbers well and that the price makes sense at the price you're able to get it for. Roads can get steep in these areas, definitely something you wanna think about. Um, a lot of times, if you have a view, if you want a view, you have to go up the mountain so uh, or up a mountain. So uh, keep in mind, if you're looking at view properties, if there's a property you want to put an offer on that has a view, always ask about the steepness of the driveway because there are some really terrifying ones. There are I've been up some driveways in Chalet Village in Gatlinburg with the top off my Jeep that I thought I was going to fall out the top of my Jeep. It was so steep. So definitely always ask about that. A little bit of steepness is okay as long as you're warning your guests ahead of time that, hey, our driveway is steep, but um, definitely ask, there are some, there are some steep, steepness level, grade level uh, deal breakers. And if you're at, if you ask me, so always keep that in mind when you're looking at view property and sometimes not view properties, just always keep it in mind, actually. Yeah. Okay. What type of cabins do guests want? So I'm going to let Tim and Julie answer this, uh, touch on this too, but like there's not a specific kind that works better or worse than anything else, as long as it's cabiny or, you know, it's not like a brick ranch home that you could pick up and put in Kansas City and not be able to really tell that you were in any different place. Um, honeymoon cabins work great. Uh, this bottom left picture is a neighborhood. We, I call those cabin camps where it's a bunch of the same cabins all in a row. Uh, Tam owns one in there that does in one of those that does great. Um, big ones, little ones. 70s A-frames, they all really, really work. Uh, but I'll let Tim and Julie, if you guys have anything to add. 
Yeah, you kind of hit a lot of it there, but it really goes back to there's a lot of different people here that come here and there's a lot of different people that want different things. Uh, you know, that great big mansion looking one, you know, obviously you may get a baseball team in there and the one right next to the little honeymoon one people, lots of people come here for, for their honeymoon or just to have a weekend away from their kids. Um, but it really, you know, you do, like Avery said, you don't want vinyl siding. You don't want, uh, you don't want a brick house. You want something that looks cabiny. Uh, a view is great, but it doesn't have to be, uh, nestled in the woods. A nice spot does fantastic as well. So, um, in the Valley up on the Hill, you know, kind of doesn't, I'll say it doesn't matter, but it, uh, they all have their pros and cons and different people want different things. Yeah. I found that, uh, that more of the flatlander type often it feels more comfortable in these, uh, resort style, um, developments where they can, you know, especially folks from big cities. I've had occasions where they they want to see their neighbors. They don't want to feel like they're out alone in the woods because that scares them. Um, and then there are also plenty of people who definitely want to be out in the woods and feel really private, even if um, you know whether there's a view or not. So different strokes for different folks. Everybody has something that's going to be the, to their taste, and we can we can offer all of it. And they will generally find you. You don't necessarily have to worry about finding them. Just give an accurate representation of what your cabin is. And, um, and yeah, yeah, gosh, my best, I own three small cabins and my best performing one is a little studio. It's not even a one bedroom. It's an open concept, um, 550 square foot cabin. And it's set just on, you know, on just over an acre surrounded by trees. So it feels really private and it does the best, even though my other two cabins are a little bit bigger um, and maybe even finished a little bit nicer. So yeah, like they, Avery said, I've got one in, I've got one in a resort. It does fantastic. I've got another one up a pretty, you know, it's not the steepest driveway in Sevier County, but it's pretty it's, steep, but it's got a, it's pretty close, <laughs> but it's got a great view and that one crushes it too. That actually happens to be the first cabin Avery sold as an agent. So yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah. And Tim ended up with it. I do want to say, so while there is no wrong size to buy, they will all do exactly what you need them to do. The highest return on investment is typically like the four bedroom and up range, but one through three will do exactly what you need them to do as well. Also keep in mind when you're looking at listings, even if it look at the number of bathrooms, not the number of bedrooms, because the way the septic or the way we have to list things when we list properties on the MLS here is according to the number of bedrooms the septic is rated for. So it is really common for there to be a septic system that is smaller than the actual number of bedrooms. So you could see a listing that says two bedrooms, four baths, and you think, oh, that's really expensive for a two bedroom. I'm not even going to click on that. There's a good chance that it is an actual four bedroom, but it's on a two bedroom septic and you can rent it as a four bedroom. You just can't sell it as a four bedroom. Um, but you definitely want to uh, speak to a septic professional about any of that stuff. Yeah. Great point that I'm glad you mentioned because yes, it's very common or like lofted bedrooms, um, loft areas that are open to below, but still, uh, you know, still function like bedrooms. That is something that you can market for rent as a, you know, as an additional bedroom, <laughs> but may not be able to sell it as an additional bedroom. Yes. So uh, now we are on um, the cabin feature slide. Uh, so there are some features that will fetch you a higher gross annual income than others, but again, like a view will get you a little bit more money. It's also going to cost you quite a bit more money to get a view property. Same thing with an indoor pool. The indoor pool is probably the amenity that is going to uh, add the most value in terms of income, but you're also, again, going to pay quite a bit more for that. But uh, I just want to reiterate that you do not have to have a view. You do not have to have an indoor pool in order to cash flow really, really well, because like Julie and Tim said earlier, there are lots and lots of different kinds of people that come here. They're looking for a lot of different things. I know if Luke and I are going to go on vacation, he wants to be out in the woods. But like if we have my mom along to help us with the kids also because we like to hang out with her, but she likes to help with the kids. She She's going to want to be in a resort where she can walk down to the pool and read a book. So 
Um, yeah, and Luke, indoor pools are, are pretty difficult to find. Those are kind of a new thing as the past few years. They do add quite a bit of extra income, but again, you don't have to. There's something, there is a cash flowing property for almost every budget. And I guess with that, we will go ahead and open it up for questions. So um, if you guys can, uh, there's a reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Use that to raise your hand and we will call on you in order. And uh, we're all very, very happy to answer your questions. We've got about 20 minutes, so we've got time for, for at least a few. Looks, Damon, you were first. Hey, Avery, um, thank you. I really do appreciate you guys for doing this. It's, um, it's very helpful. I think my question is probably geared toward Tim and Julie. Um, I'm an agent myself in the state of Maryland. Honestly, I didn't know what the, Sm uh, the Great Smoky Mountains was until about two weeks ago, which is, I, I, I find a little strange um, just because of the popularity of the area. Do you guys work more with buyers is the short-term shop more buyer heavy than listing heavy? And do you guys work both sides of the coin? I don't know how dual agency works in the state of Tennessee. Well, we uh, we will represent both buyers and sellers, not typically on the same transaction, but um, I would say we're more focused on buyers and uh, you know, as opposed to focused on sellers, but we certainly work with both. And a lot of our buyers become sellers as they look to expand their portfolio. Right. So we're always happy to, uh, you know, to meet the needs of our clients there. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Richard. Hey there. Uh, so I, I want to get into the Smokies and it sounds like it's a pretty hot market. What can, what expectation should a new investor coming to that market set as far as like Time frame, like how quickly do you need to get that offer in, and you know uh, what kind of expectations around that. And another question is between the new construction and like existing cabins, is the competition level like the same, or I'm just kind of curious about that. The, it's all really competitive. So um, the new construction, a lot of people will uh, that it's really hard to say. Like the new construction and the existing construction is all going to go really quick. There's a lot more buyers than there are inventory as there is across the country right now. And um, so it just kind of depends on what your goals are. If you're okay with waiting like a year at least to start cash flowing, that's great. Uh, but if you want to start right now, then you can expect, I mean, I would say expect to make five offers before one is accepted because it is a very, very competitive market in terms of multiple offers on most things. So uh, it's, I mean, as soon as I say that, watch, you're going to go get your first one accepted and you'll have it done in like 30 days flat. But I would expect to make five uh, and don't, don't get discouraged if you're not winning offers. Every, every lost offer is a learning experience for doing better on the next one. And there will always be another cabin. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Angela. Hey guys. Um, so my question is, what do you think? I know it's probably hard to answer, but like, what's the minimum amount you think um, you could get a cabin or condo or any sort of property in the Smokies? I'll let Tim or Julie take that one. Yeah, I'd say right now entry level for a uh, for a cabin is going to be probably in the low 400s. You know, one bedrooms these days go anywhere from like the 400s to the 500s, or in creeping into the low 500s. So that's kind of the state of the market right now. We don't do a lot of condos here. They definitely exist, but um, the HOAs tend to be high and the rental performance is not quite as good as a cabin will be. So by the time you kind of do the math on all of that, your returns are generally going to be better on cabins. Um, Lend, lending's yeah. different on those two. So that, that's, yeah, it's, it's more homework. complicated, <laughs> higher down payments and things like that. Tim, are you, can you speak to like condo values these days? Not, not really here. Uh, I don't, I mean, I've seen them, uh, you know, they, they, they pop up in the 350 range, but uh, yeah. You know, again, you're going to be paying a lot higher down payment than you probably would be on a, on a cabin. So you may have the same amount of money into it. You know, Plus they, you yeah. And HOAs that, I mean, at least for here, I view them as expensive. There are other markets that, you know, these are probably puny, but 
HOA fees of, you know, $400, $500 a month. So by the time you kind of roll that into your mortgage payment, you may as well buy a cabin is my take on it for it, at least. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Sue. Hey guys, so I have a couple of questions. I'll run off them. Um, the first one is, are appraisal gaps and removing inspection contingencies common in the area? Um, number two, I hear that four beds is the sweet spot. Um, do we have any minimum uh, guess? Like, would, you, would, it, would four beds usually sleep 12, 14, or 15 guests? Um, because it is like I I'm I'm in Florida and I I know like if you have fourteen and above it's very good in Florida like just from having a five bedroom and a three bedroom, um and I had my third question now oh, I can't remember so, so I'll come back to it. Cool, I'll grab that first part of the question and then Luke will grab the second part. So in terms of appraisal gaps, yes, one thousand percent common in this market. You just about always have to have offer over asking with an appraisal gap to win if it's a brand new on market property. Of course, it can be a pretty good strategy to look for properties that have a high amount of days on market if you want to um, not have to do that. Uh, a lot of times there's not necessarily anything wrong with a property that has high days on market. I mean, there can be, but a lot of people will pass it over just if they've seen that it's been on the market for over a week. So that can be a strategy. And in terms of removing inspection contingency, I would not, and the short-term shop would not advise completely removing that contingency to where you're not even doing an inspection and you don't have any, any recourse at all. I would say offering as is, is very common, but still subject to the inspection contingencies. So that way you're still able to do the inspection. You're telling the seller up front okay, I'm, I'm already telling you, I'm not going to ask you to fix anything and I'm not going to ask for any money off, but that way you're still protecting yourself by keeping the contingency in case you get in there and do the inspection and the place is falling down, then you're still able to get out. So I would say as is subject to inspection contingency, but not removing that contingency altogether. Um, Luke, do you want to hit the heads and beds question? Yeah. Hey guys. So yeah. Um, if you purchase a property through the short-term shop, you have access to uh, what we call Management Monday. And in that class, I will teach you everything you need to know about how to manage one of these things, uh, the short-term shop way with tremendous amounts of success. And uh, that class is free. We teach a lot of classes that are free, by the way. You can find the links to those on our website on the education tab. Uh, but it is short-term shop culture to not necessarily throw a lot of heads in the beds, as they say. Uh, four bedroom, which was the example. I personally would only sleep 10 in there. I do go on the very conservative side of number of people. Um, I think 12 would be totally fine. I personally would not recommend going higher than that. I think you're uh, looking for, uh, the more people you put in a house, the grumpier each person is, right? So for me, it's uh, two people per bedroom plus two is how I would do that. And on a four bedroom, which was the example, like I said, uh, would be 10 people. And I want to just jump in because- I have a client who recently sold a five bedroom cabin here. He only slept 10 people in it and it had outstanding, outstanding performance. Um, it did, you know, it had some features that were more desirable here, but I just want to set that out there as an example of, even though he wasn't, you know, he could have slept probably, you know, 20 people in there if he'd wanted to, but he kept it at 10 and it was extremely successful with it. So it doesn't necessarily have to tie into the number of, of heads and beds. I agree. Okay. Actually, I have a five bedroom. I only sleep 10. And that particular property, it's actually very, it's small on the square footage uh, for a five bedroom, but I only sleep 10 in that one. Uh, Tim, did you have something? Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say the ROI isn't just from packing people in there. You know, the, the increase in ROI at a four bedroom, there's you know, just some magic around, you know, your expenses aren't four times as much as a one bedroom, you know, and, and you're going to spend the same amount of time managing a four bedroom as you do a one bedroom. So it uses, you know, there's other factors other than just putting a lot of people in there. And, uh, okay. Got it. And I now remember my third one, Julie, you mentioned, um, I'm sorry, Avery, you mentioned, um, pool is one of the good ones to have. Um, what are your thoughts on a theater room? Like in Florida, having a theater is like one of the big pluses, like, is that the same in Tennessee? And, 
do people, I don't know if usually there is a great room or like there is a special room that comes, you know, a, a four or five bed comes with, or is converting one of the beds into a theater room, a thing or common practice? So theater rooms definitely are a, um, a, an amenity that will add some value. I personally, and some of the other agents and investor on, investors on this call might disagree, which is fine. Uh, I personally wouldn't sacrifice a bedroom to make it a theater room. I think a, a bedroom yeah. is worth more than a theater room, but I'd be interested to hear what everybody else has to say too. I, I, agree. The, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the larger properties here um, when you get into the four bedroom size and up, they will, I would say most properties out here are going to have a recreation room or a game room. Um, and then, you know, four bedrooms and up, a lot of them do have dedicated theater rooms. Um, so depending on this, you know, once you get into bigger square footage, that is a fairly common amenity and certainly does add some value. I'd say the pool is step definitely the number one thing but <laughs> that you know that is more expensive and and so forth but after that i would want to have a recreation room and then uh, probably third on my list would be a theater yeah you want to have you want to have some sort of entertainment for people uh you know and, and it goes back to not packing it full you know if you put 16 people in a four bedroom you don't have room for people to breathe let alone have fun while they're on vacation so having having some sort of uh entertainment is good so i will add that i did at one point in time have a two-bedroom that had nothing at all no video games no pool table no entertainment other than televisions and it did very 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 well uh, i will say that particular property might might not be a good example because the view was just absolutely i mean nobody's playing video games with a view like that you know what i mean at so, the end of the day we have a national park attached to us we do have a national <laughs> park right outside your door go outside and have fun <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anthony. Hey guys. Uh, I just wanted to contract my first STR down in Destin and I'm looking uh, Smoky Mountains next. My, I have a couple quick questions. You guys kind of touched on it. My, when we go on Zillow, most of the things that we're seeing popping up are in these areas that seem to be right next to other cabins. And I know you guys kind of touched on it, but my wife is of the mindset that people, when they come out to the woods, they come out to the cabins, they want to be not near anyone. Um, is, is there that big of a distinction from, you know, being side by side for all these places than the woods? I, I just don't know how big of a, a difference it really makes. I don't it's think it's truly... really been... Sorry, Tim, go ahead. I was gonna say it's it's truly both. I mean, there are. I mean, you drive through these resorts and they're full, and then right. but then you go out to the out in the woods and there's. I mean, they they both do really well. I mean, they're gotcha. they can, either one of them can truly do really well. I I own one in a resort and two out, and they gotcha. Uh, it's it's the same. It, it really is. Okay, cool. And then yeah, my second question is: since a lot of these they're side by side seem to be a lot of new construction, what's the What's kind of the quality of the new builds over there? Because I've I, I invest long term. I'm in a bunch of different states, and some states it just you know some of the 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 quality of the builds are not as great as in other places. Are the quality of developers and builders over in you know the Smoky Mountains? They they do a pretty good job with the new stuff. Well, you're, you're going to get different, uh, you know, everybody does it a little bit differently. We've got, you know, I know of one developer right now that's really focusing on luxury cabins and he does a really high quality build. Um, for the most part, we're going to have an average construction quality here. Um, these are all purpose built to be rentals. Um, and so they're basically manufactured to make money. So they're going to hold up but they generally are not going to be fancy and have a, you know, have a lot of, you know, high end finishes necessarily, unless you're specifically going for that, that uh, luxury uh, demographic there. Awesome. Sounds good guys. I'm excited to uh, keep moving forward and keep building with you guys. Have a good day. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Keith. Hello. A uh, quick question. Is the uh, Dollywood theme park typically, typically open year round? It has a down season um, that's right now, that's why it showed up as temporarily closed in our slide. Um, they close up, I think, early January and then um, reopen, I 
think like mid-March. Yeah. So they're like they take about two months off and just kind of go through everything, zhuzh it up and make sure everything's working the way it, it needs to and, you know, use the break to prepare for the next season. So it's not 12 months a year now. That's an excellent topic, by the way. We should touch briefly on, on seasonality. We have not uh, mentioned that at all. Uh, You're it's, right. It's generally about a 10-month uh, market here. That's one of the biggest uh, features that people like is that there's year-round money. With the exception of right now, uh, all, of, all of us are losing our minds a little bit because our properties are empty. I personally I like it. that because I've been in the <laughs> game for a minute. Julia will agree. Uh, Avery will agree. It's nice to have the downtime this time of year because it is coming back hard and heavy. And we're, we're shooting this in the uh, end of, very end of January. So in about three weeks, we'll all be swamped. But uh, 10, month, uh, 10 month season. And uh, I had another point there, but uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought now, that up. Now's the time you do all your repairs and you know all the stuff that's kind of stacked up throughout the year. Oh, my other point was snow. We don't really get any snow. Therefore, things are open all the time, this except year. for we've gotten some snow this year. And it it's seems like every year. year we say it doesn't snow here. And then all of a sudden it snows for a few weeks. It and snowed more this year than it normally does. This year was a little rough. Yeah. Cool. Stacy. Hi, guys. Um, I'm working with Derek and I see that he's on the call. So, hey, Derek. Um, but I'm just wondering. Oh, I Derek. Oh yeah, he's there. I saw him, but oh, well, um, Derek, answer some questions. Derek, where are you at? Yeah, where are you at, man? <laughs> Derek, uh, number one over here. Number one uh, agent in the Smoky Mountains, uh, 2021. Number yeah, one, yeah. period. Derek yeah. closed 117 cabins last year, maybe a little bit more than that. Which is not humanly possible. We still don't see him though. Where is he? I'm probably buried in the. Uh, raise, raise your hand, Derek. Raise, yeah, raise your, your hand, and it'll you bring it to the top. top. All right, hang on. <laughs> While Come he's doing party. that, though, I've Let's got go. some Zillow searches set up. Um, and my question is more around, like, is there a better way? Like, what's the fastest way? Because obviously things move super quickly. Um, like, is it really just getting an MLS set, search set up? Or I know, Luke, you've said you like Realtor.com in past calls like this. Um, yeah, the thing I have a hard time with is, like, my husband's a realtor, and I like the MLS. And you can, like, sort those days on market a lot better. I, I have a hard time doing that on, like, Zillow. So I would say an MLS setup, MLS feed with your agent will be the fastest. Um, so that Derek, they're now, now Derek's front and center on my screen here. So yeah, it changed. No, no, you are now everybody is. <laughs> oh, we changed it from gallery. There we go. Did that it. work? Oh, is that you? Well, whatever. No, right. I don't. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody yeah, changed but that's the view. Fastest. Yeah, that's fastest. Um, MLS setup, but you know, it doesn't hurt because I know every buyer and I do this too, when I'm buying in an area that I'm not an agent, I'm always looking around on, on Zillow and realtor and it doesn't hurt because there are times that some, that an agent, like a random agent, who's part of a different MLS, like an hour away will happen to get a listing in the market that you're looking in. And it won't be on the MLS that, um, that you're set up with, it'll be like somewhere way over there. And so that would show up on realtor.com or Zillow and not show up on your MLS feed. So, you know, you want to just keep keeping an eye on things because stuff like that can happen and you can find stuff that way, but an MLS feed is going to be the best way to go. I look at all of them every day and, uh, generally here, you know, they, most properties, not all, most properties, most agents are from here. They set some kind of a deadline. So it's not like, you know, I'd say stuff goes, usually sells within an hour to 48 to 72 hours. It's kind of normal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just wanted to stay on top of it. So cool. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Christine. Hi. Hey. Can you just uh, circle back to the thing you said about the septic system? Because I saw a listing on your site the other day that the... Uh, had that specifically mentioned and I hadn't seen that before. So it's a, it listed as a two bathroom, two bath, but it has additional three bedrooms. And in the listing, it says that the, that the sewer is for two bedrooms. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here, since most properties are on septic systems, any property that is on a septic system, it's always going to be approved for a certain number of bedrooms. And that, that will 
that goes back to like when the house is built, one of the first things that they have to do is get a septic approval from the environmental health department. And the environmental health department will go out to the lot and determine how many bedrooms that land can accommodate. Now, this can also, you know, if someone's only building a two bedroom house, they're only going to approve it for a two bedroom house. They're not going to say, oh, but you could put six here. But um, at the end of the day, that is what determines the size of the septic. Um, and that's always based, they call it a bedroom count. And they're assuming there's going to be two people, two people per bedroom in every house. Um, so in situations like this, the, when the property was built, they approved it for a two bedroom septic. I probably know what property you're talking about. Um, and then over the course of time, you know, the house was expanded or added onto, or they just decided to build some bonus rooms, um, even though they weren't part of the septic permit. We see that a lot here with like finished basements and, um, you know, loft spaces, things like that. But what it we can't market a property with more bedrooms than what the septic is approved for. So even though you could functionally have five bedrooms in that house, you can't list it as a five bedroom house for sale. You but can list it as a five bedroom house with the toilets and the drains. Sorry? Will people get problems with the toilets and drains and clocks? Uh, you just, know, to, just to move things along, we have a video on this on our YouTube channel, which is not my shining moment in, uh, of sexiness in my life, but uh, <laughs> feel free to check out our YouTube channel. And uh, I posted the link to this in the chat. Uh, but uh, yeah, septics are a little weird in East Tennessee occasionally. I didn't mean to cut you off. Feel free to continue no, on the uh, that's fine. That's a rather the crappy hole, but... subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely check out that video. Luke talks about it in depth. And, and um, I mean, but bottom line, you don't want to have like 30 people sleeping in that house on a two bedroom septic. I think then that, you know, you run the strong possibility of overloading it. However, it's very common for there to be like one or two extra rooms usually is not a problem. Um, you'll just want to stay on top of your maintenance. Thank you. Cool. Susan, you're next. Hi, thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about new construction. Um, how you go about vetting the contractors? Because there's more than one on the MLS right now. Like, if you wanted to contract with them, and since it's you know a distance away, like, what are your recommendations on vetting people? I mean, usually you're just going to you know talk with your agent, kind of get a feel for their reputation. Um, I would say if you can, that's going to be probably the best thing to do is see. <coughs> what their reputation is if they have one, if they're, if they've been in the area for long, um, you know, anybody who's like brands making new, you probably want to stay away from, or at least approach with more skepticism if they're more established than, you know, than people who generally know their name. Um, it's a little tough because I mean, builders around here, it's not like, you know, Toll Brothers or whatever, who are just doing these huge developments that are publicly traded companies. It's all small time operations usually, and uh, they don't have fancy websites. They don't have, you know, much to really vet them on other than reputation. So that's, that's where I would start. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucas. Hi everyone. Um, what kind of uh, help we can expect from the STS agent for a new BSTR investor? What kind of what? What kind of help we can expect from the STS agent for a newbie a STR investor? So your agent is going to be able to tell you, give you a range of what the property should be able to gross. It is up to you to do your own push-ups in terms of a more granular analysis than that, because there are too many variables about each of your personal situations for one agent or one person to be able to, to do analyses for you. So they'll be able to give you a gross. It is up to you to kind of do the further analysis. We have a really helpful tool on our website, a calculator that I built around short-term rental investing to help with that. Uh, che, if you wanna put a link there. And then also we have um, the, I would say, 
use a combination of AirDNA, uh, rabu.com, which is R-A-B-B-U, and maybe the Price Labs market dashboard function to kind of figure out like that. Those are three different places you can get market wide data, except the Price Labs one is only about a 30 day snapshot. But uh, use as many market wide data tools, not property specific analyzers or property specific projection tools, but market wide to kind of give you a baseline of what things should be able to do and then use that calculator and you should be able to plug in the numbers from any property that you were looking at and quickly analyze. Enemy method, enemy method oh, yes. and enemy method all day long. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Cameron. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, looking at some of the properties, if we're looking to purchase a property that needs a facelift or we want to do some updating, with having small populations that live there year round, what kind of lead times are you looking at to get a GC out, to get an estimate and to actually get work done? Since I would assume a lot of the properties are getting worked on this time of the year during the slow season. It can take a minute. Uh, I'll let, question. yeah, I'll let Julie or Luke or Tim answer that one because it think. handles all the, all the fixes on our properties, so. On Derek's rehabbing some of his, so this oh, might Derek. be great for Derek. Well, I've I rehabbed uh, five over the past year. Uh, Derek, go ahead. I want to hear his war stories. Well, I'm currently rehabbing seven at the moment <laughs> in a different level. Some of them haven't been started, but I mean, I built I built a reputation with a particular contractor last year where I spent, you know, more money than I used to make in a year uh, with him. So basically, I got. I had enough volume where I was able to basically lock him down. He's like mine for January and February and into March. He's not like not working with anybody else because I'm giving him a ton of work. So that's not the best example. But the other side of it is there's a lot of handymen out there. There's a lot of contractors out there. It's like a contractors are the same. I don't care where you live in this country. You're going to have to do some due diligence. You're going to have to dig in. You're going to have to call a lot. You're going to call 10. Five will show up. Three will give you an estimate. And one of them will actually follow up with you. That's the guy doing the job. I mean, that's, that's about all there is. It's, it's running the numbers and just pushing. There's a lot of them out there. You just got to dig in. Just, it's like buying a property. You just got to dig in and keep going until you find the one that works. Yeah, nailed it. There's no easy way out when it comes to doing rehabs and remodels and things like that. And uh, Derek, uh, again, tooting his horn, number one agent in the Smoky Mountain market, 2021. Uh, he, guy knows what he's talking about. Crushed it, but he is also now moving to Gulf Shores to help us in that market, help our our other agent in there, Jonathan. So moving to the beach. Overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> uh let's see. Who was next? Sherry's iPhone. Uh yes, I just had a quick question about the um cabins. Um, you talked about um resort cabins versus cabins that's scattered about. Is there a certain area to look for if you're looking for the care cabins that's more close together versus the ones that's further apart? Well, if you want it to be in a resort, the, a lot of the resorts are closer into the city limits of Gatlinburg and the city limits of Pigeon Forge. But honestly, there are resorts kind of scattered out everywhere. Like there's some out in Wears Valley. So it just kind of depends. You'll be able to tell from the almost from the front picture on any listing if it's in a resort because you'll be able to see the other cabins around. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. All right, we're going to take what this will be the last question because I want to be respectful of y'all's time. Uh, but Dan, you are well, actually, okay, we're gonna just do the last three because there's only three of y'all. I don't want to cut the last two off. Never mind, don't listen to me. Dan, your turn. Yeah, uh, my question is we we have a um an Airbnb in town where we live and we're wanting to expand, but we're just wondering if it's worth all the work and the cost. We're actually gonna make that much more money in the Smokies. So I was wondering if you had like a range of like what a range for an average three bedroom, four bedroom, or five bedroom might gross. It's really difficult to say because there are, there's going to be a range within each bedroom number. So like a four bedroom right now with, you know, just very average 25 years old, no view, no pool might be 800,000 and it might gross 110,000 a year, but a brand new construction one might be 950, a million, and it might gross 150. And then a four bed, brand new four bedroom, new construction with a pool might be 1.5 million and it might gross 250. So it just kind of depends um, because there's a range within each number of bedrooms. Briefly on this, it is my opinion, of course, as the management guy here at the shop, that it is 99% you and 1% the property. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, those numbers are helpful and 
appreciate that. Uh, Juhai, Juhi, sorry. Correct me. Yeah, Juhi. Uh, Juhi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my question is regarding a uh, typical uh, non cabin type home, like a typical suburban home. So, uh, so those, uh, the listing price for those is like one half or one third of what typical cabin homes typical sell for. And there's some, uh, quite a few listings of those as well. So is there a market for those type of homes as well? Because if your numbers make sense for those homes, uh, can we look at those homes as well? I personally oh. wouldn't because if I'm going to spend the money on it, I want it to be something that's going to rent really, really well. Not something that I like scraped the bottom to see if it would work. Uh, there's a reason that the suburban homes are a lot cheaper than the cabin properties and it's because they don't perform as well. So uh, I'm not going to tell anybody that they can't do anything if you want to go down that road and do an experiment, but I don't really like experiments. Uh, I like data. So I probably would not do that. Also, also some of those, a lot of those are in areas that do have restrictions here. So there are protected areas around here so that the locals do have somewhere to live. And a lot of the normal looking houses, especially the ones that are a lot cheaper. The reason they're a lot cheaper is because they're, they're in an area where it's not short-term friend or short-term rental friendly. Thank you. Jen. I think you're on mute still. Hi, I'm sorry if this question was already answered. Is it possible to find turnkey furnished cabins or should someone expect to put another $30,000, $40,000 into an empty cabin to furnish it? Oh, that's a really, really good question and something we should have covered already. So most of the cabins in this market are going to come furnished already. So you're not gonna have to shell out another 40,000. Every now and then you'll find one that's not furnished, but uh, for the most part, they're gonna come furnished. I will say the quality of furnishings will vary. It'll depend on how it was treated by the previous owner. Um, but yeah, you should have most of what you need to get started and you may just want to replace a couple of pieces as time goes on. Cool. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so, so much for coming. Uh, if you are not a client and you would like to become a client, if you want to buy a property with us, head on over to the shorttermshop.com and click that schedule consultation button. We are booked out a little bit right now, but we can open up some more slots to accommodate. Also, if you're still feeling like, oh my God, I don't really know what I'm doing. I need some more information. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. We have a podcast, The Short Term Show, and then also my book, Short Term Rental, Long Term Wealth. So thanks guys so much for coming and we hope you found it helpful. Thanks everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.